Hello, my name is Attorney Sean Smith. I'm so excited to invite you to our podcast and YouTube production called Law Matters, where we talk about how the law is instrumental in your everyday life. In fact, we break it down into a fashion that everyone can understand. I am so excited, happy, thrilled, invigorated to have with me my beautiful wife, the mother of my three wonderful children, Connie Veronica Spence Smith. Baby, welcome to my uh, podcast and YouTube channel. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. So happy to have you here. Now, tell us a little bit about your background and why I have you on with us today, other than the fact that I love you so much. Nice. <laughs> so I am a licensed clinical social worker. I've been in healthcare for about 25 years, specifically in hospital medical social work, and I've been a case manager at one of the largest hospitals in Florida, where I work with a population including adults, children, and that's it. And now specifically, um, my practice deals with elder law, helping those of our elder citizens in today's society. In what ways can you help uh, elderly individuals? Well, in the hospital setting, we help them prepare to leave. So that would be making any arrangements that they needed to return home, to go to a skilled nursing facility, rehab, even hospice sometimes. So that is what I can do in this practice as well, um, help people and their families make that transition from the hospital if needed, and even from a skilled nursing facility to back home. Now, oftentimes, uh, I talk to individuals about Medicaid planning and estate planning, dealing with wills and probates and trust, things that happen when they pass away. Also, in terms of Medicaid planning, helping them afford uh, staying in a skilled nursing facility. Now, what sorts of resources do you provide to those individuals who have a loved one who is elderly, who is dealing with the challenges of being a senior citizen? How can you help help them? In addition to the help they'll receive from their hospital case manager or maybe even their insurance case manager, I can help them find a facility, understand their insurance benefits, um, find out what they qualify for when they are leaving the hospital, if they need additional help at home, and help them understand what they might need towards the end of the life if that's something that they're dealing with. Now, oftentimes, uh, we have individuals who are trying to avoid having to go in a nursing home and they are got their loved one at home that they're trying to take care of and typically it's maybe the, the husband or the wife taking care of the spouse or maybe sometimes even the children who are coming over to assist their elderly uh, loved one. How do you help in, in those ways as well? You know, we try to do an assessment to find out exactly what the need is. Some people are overwhelmed with the amount of care that mom or dad needs that you didn't anticipate. Um, sometimes it's finding alternatives or finding assistance to come into the home, or sometimes it's the reality that we may need to not be able to stay at home. One of the things I talk about when I do a webinar on this subject is what got me involved in, in elder care. And I remember the, the uh, story of when we were at our Christmas vacation, not this past year, but the year before last. Uh, and when uh, I got the call from, I don't know if it was you or, or, or my sister, that my dad had passed out uh, while we were at the uh, Airbnb. Tell us a little bit about what happened, because that experience really made me realize how important it is that we begin to have a plan for our elderly loved ones. Because even before then, we think that our parents will, will live forever. We don't realize that we need to put a plan in place. So give our, our audience a little bit of understanding of background of what happened, because you were right there on the scene. And I have to admit that knowing that I had you there and the assurances and knowing the resources and what could happen or what we needed to do gave me a sense of peace. So describe for our audience exactly kind of what happened. Well, after a day of fun, we're on our way back to our residence and, you know, he slowed down a little bit. We all were a bit tired, um, but he just kept saying, I I'm not feeling well. I want to quickly get to the room. And the 
walk that we had done the entire week seemed like the longest walk of the day like it was taking forever for us to get there um but as soon as we got literally i opened the front door he collapsed to his knees um we saw that he was slowly sort of losing his alertness so while we got him safely to a position where he could be seated we um called 911 and i believe we might have called you right after um wasn't really sure what was happening but it really could see that he needed help right away so fortunately the emt they arrived very very quickly that subsequently led to maybe a two or three day hospital stay come to find out he did have some type of obstruction like a small bowel obstruction which could have been potentially very very serious so we're glad that we were at that place to be able to get the help at that time but it really was an eye-opener for all of us because our parents are our caretakers and we think even when we're older they're our caretakers so that was a wake-up call I think for both of us and you seem to know what to do when I came upstairs and I found my dad laying down you know I didn't see any any fear or an anxiety in, in, in your face or even in your voice. How do you think your experience, your background helped you in that particular situation? It possibly did help, but I think it was more like I knew the right people were on the way. He seemed to still be with us. So, I mean, I don't know. I guess that's God. <laughs> I don't know why I was calm if you thought I was calm, um, but I'm glad everything worked out. We were just at the right place at the right time. Yeah. In addition to my experience with, with my dad, we also had an experience with kind of both of your parents as well. And I want to specifically talk about uh, your mom when, when my Aunt Enid got, got sick. Um, and I remember going to visit her in Miami. She was complaining about her legs, her legs hurting. Um, do you remember that time when we began learning about your mom being sick and some of the things that we needed to do? I do. <laughs> what, were, what were your thoughts going into that? First, learning about her sickness. How did, how did that impact you? It was a whirlwind. I mean, to be quite honest, my mom, what, 75 at the time? But mm. overall, at least to us, was very healthy. Didn't have any thing other than high blood pressure that she took a medication for. So we got a sudden thrust into illness when she was diagnosed with kidney failure. And a few weeks later, we learned it was multiple myeloma. So it kind of shook all of us. But at the same time, the doctors at the time seemed very positive. We're going to kick its butt is what mm -hmm. verbatim mm -hmm. we were told. And um, I will say things went very quickly after that. Now, prior to us getting this information and learning that your mom had cancer and, and kidney failure, I think it may have been maybe a year before that, we began, based upon, I think, your instruction and motivation and on Enid's, began to put some documents into place. Do you remember what those documents were? I do. And I'm going to preface that by saying that we had probably been talking about it for years. Yes. And in the hospital, even my colleagues, which were known healthcare people are probably the worst. We probably, we tell and we teach and we don't do it. Mm -hmm. So, and I will attest that even your aunt, who's a nurse, we talk about, oh, every Thanksgiving we need to sit down, everybody needs to get their documents, and we never did. So right before that, we did get in place a power of attorney and a healthcare surrogate. So that pretty much just identified me as being able to help her if it was ever needed to be able to navigate through the hospital, talk to the physicians or whoever I needed to speak to on her behalf. Now, the first thing I want our listeners to realize is that illnesses and sicknesses happen suddenly, right? And if we keep talking about what we need to do when this happens, by the time it happens, it's going to be too, too late. Oftentimes, yeah. And today, everything could be fine and instantly tomorrow, and I've had that experience where people have run to us and said, well, I need this document, I need that document, and these people are in the hospital, or worst case scenario, they're incapacitated, so we can't utilize these particular documents. So the first warning and instruction I want to give people is, you know, as my mom used to tell me, if you fail to plan, plan to fail. Absolutely. 
the documents that, that we drafted for, for Aunt Enid was a durable power of attorney, uh, another one was a health care surrogate. Um, how were those documents able to assist you when your mother became, or when Aunt Enid became ill? Well, it really gave me access to talk freely to the health care providers, um, to speak to her insurance company, actually make changes because I actually switched her from her HMO plan to straight Medicare once she had kidney failure. And why did you do that? Well, from my experience, um, it you have a greater benefit just having straight Medicare when you have a lot of comorbidity. So with her new diagnosis... Well, you just used a, a word that, you know, me even as a lawyer don't even know, comorbidity. So it just means additional diagnoses that you may have. Uh -huh. So for her, all she had initially was high blood pressure. So now she has kidney failure, which required her to be on um, hemodialysis. So knowing that she would get a greater access to benefits with straight Medicare, I was able to call her insurance company, disenroll her, and have her have Medicare that helped with her transportation to and from dialysis, um, helped with getting just all the services that she needed. If not for your background, would you have known to switch her insurance? And in addition, would you have known how to switch her insurance? Probably not. <laughs> and that and that switch, of course, ended up being a benefit to Aunt Tina. Right. Now, I remember that once she became sick and we learned that she needed to have, have kidney failure and she then had to go to um, dialysis. What was that like? What was that experience like? It was a lot, but it was literally something that I did on a daily basis, setting it up. So while she did have a hospital case manager to do that, I was right on top of them. <laughs> because I knew how quickly it needed to be done, especially with us not living in the area. And I knew how easy it was for things to fall in between the cracks if every I wasn't dotted and T wasn't crossed. So just my experience was definitely not to be overbearing, but actually to help the case manager and the social worker that was already there to, well, don't forget this, and can I help you do that? That was more of my role um, in trying to assist with her care. Now, what you were able to help do for your mother and, of course, you know, her family being you know, your sister and even me and, and, and her, her husband, um, why do you think that would be a benefit to those individuals listening? Why do they need another case manager? You already talked about there's a case manager in the hospital. There's an insurance case manager. You know, isn't, isn't, aren't two enough? Or, or what can you provide <laughs> to the family that they're right. not getting from these other case managers? You'd be surprised. <laughs> so in the hospital, you know, that case manager can have up to 40 patients a day. And likewise, that insurance case manager probably double that. So while they have a standard of things that they may need to provide, they probably don't have the time to give you that individualized attention to answer your questions, to explain things other than, here, read this, it's all there. So I shudder to think what families go through, even though I've been on both sides. Um, I know how limited it can be in the hospital. You may just simply not have the time to give that family all the attention and all the understanding that they need. And aren't there interests, like for, the, for example, the hospital case manager, her direct boss is the hospital, so she's answering to the hospital. The insurance case manager, she's answering to the insurance. She's looking out for the insurance. Now, what you provide is you're an advocate for that patient. And their family. Right. So you're, you, you answer or we answer to the patient and that family. Our interest is their care and their concern. Absolutely. I want to go back with, with, with Aunt Enid again. One of the things that I saw you do was get her get her Medicaid or community Medicaid. Um, what was that process like and why, how, is, how was community Medicaid important to her? Well, that was long before she got ill. But what I saw was, you know, obviously her income changed drastically. She became retired. I saw her with not a lot of medications, but I knew that having Medicaid would cover whatever meds that mm -hmm. she would need instead of getting maybe a, uh, a, a pharmacy plan with, you know, H well, 
instead of getting a pharmacy plan, you that Medicaid and she met those requirements, that that would help her to cover the cost of that if she needed transportation in the future which we didn't anticipate, but she did end up needing. So I knew it would be a benefit because she didn't have a secondary that she paid for out of pocket. Got you, got you. And I also remember when she was going to dialysis, there was a, a ambulance that picked her up? Right. Well, initially it was just a transport company. So it was just a regular car because at that time she was able to walk right to it. And then eventually those needs changed. And that's why we are constantly reassessing what the client might need because it changed and she wasn't able to use that same service. So it was changed to an ambulance. And then being an understanding case management, you knew what needed to be done and, and how it could be done. Now, one of the things that I, I, I remember you doing is getting on Enid another bed. I remember you on the phone talking to this person and talking to that person. What was that all about? Well, <laughs> Medicare doesn't like to pay for beds, so they make it very difficult, but I knew the secrets. So between talking to the case manager and the physician, I knew exactly what it needed to say on the script for her to qualify. And who paid for the bed? Medicare. Medicare paid for the bed. Okay. Um, and how did that bed assist Aunt Enid? Well, it helped because her decline was faster than we all ex anticipated. So it really helped her to be able to receive more care at home, to get in and out of the bed, to get into at eventually what ended up being a wheelchair. So the bed was just a way to keep her more comfortable and to assist those taking care of her to be able to do so. And we, we said she was on Medicare, but how did your mom get on Medicare? That's going back to when I switched her, once she was diagnosed with the kidney failure, mm -hmm. I made the switch. <laughs> and can you do that for individuals who, who come to us and need assistance with, with their, their loved ones? We always try to evaluate everything, and we do try to help the family to do it. I am here as a guide if needed to be, but we certainly want it to come, and it's easier process for me to assist or instruct a family member, like this is what you're gonna call and mm -hmm. this is what you're gonna say. So yes, I mean, I can do it if needed, and sometimes there is no family to help that elderly person, and certainly with their permission and once the right things are in place, I can help. Now I wanna talk about two specific documents more in detail that we, we did for Aunt Enid. The first one being the healthcare surrogate, right? You were the healthcare surrogate for, for your mom. How did that help you in dealing with, with Aunt Enid when she was beginning to have more lengthy stays in the hospital? Again, just allowed me to have access to speak to the physicians, um, to be able to make any changes needed again, in her insurance, and even it helped me um, to be authorized to, okay, yes, she can have this procedure, or no, we don't want her to have that. I remember a conversation that you were having with your physicians during the last months of Aunt Enid, and one of the questions that they were asking was, okay, should we put Aunt Enid on hospice, or should we not put her on hospice? And they came to you to make that decision, and tell us why they were coming to you for that answer? Well, I think at that point, she was in it. Her cognition had changed a bit. So mm -hmm. it's not that she probably couldn't answer, mm -hmm. but they probably would like uh, the family to be involved to make a better decision. And with that, just being the healthcare surrogate, I didn't take it like, okay, well, I'm making the final word. I still went to my father. I still went to my sister for us to decide as a family. Once we've drafted a healthcare surrogate document for a family and their loved one has to go into um, a, a hospital, what should the family do with that documentation? Hospital or any setting, actually, rehab, skilled nursing. If you are the healthcare surrogate, meet with the nursing director, meet with the bedside nurse, and give them your papers and say, I would like this to be part of the chart so that they know that you are who they call or whoever's listed is who they call for anything because you're not gonna know when an emergency happens because it's an emergency. So we have had instances in the hospital where we're performing CPR on someone who's a do not resuscitate because no one knows where the paper is or no one collected it. So until we can call that family member and they can confirm that they're not supposed to be resuscitated, they're resuscitating that person. So 
no one thinks about it because if your mom fell and broke her hip and went to the hospital, no one's thinking about, oh, I need to get this form from the refrigerator or from the drawer. But at some point, um, make sure that the proper staff member has it and that it's actually placed in the chart and that they know. Because what can happen is your loved one can go to several different units. And while that chart may go, that needs to be part of that report to the next provider that, hey, they have a healthcare surrogate, the daughter, her name is Connie, that's who you call if you need anything. Now, when you say go to several different units, what do you mean by that? Sure, your mom could come in for a broken hip, so she's on the orthopedic unit. During her time at the hospital, she can have a heart attack. Now she's in cardiac unit. So sometimes it's because of that. Sometimes it's only because of staffing. Or it could be because of, you know, she needs to be on ortho, but she's on med surge because ortho's full. So for whatever reason that you will never know, <laughs> she could be here. She could be on several units at a facility. And even in a skilled nursing, they can go from the ortho for the short-term side to the long-term side for any reason, but you want to make sure that your information is knowledgeable to whatever person's going to be taking care of them. So we see how vital the healthcare surrogate is in a, any hospital hospitalization, whether it be in a major hospital, a skilled nursing facility, or an ALF. I want to talk a little bit more about the durable power of attorney, which has more plays more of a role when someone may be outside of the hospital. I remember dealing with Aunt Enid at one point in time, we contacted the life insurance, her life insurance company. And um, what is it that they required from you before we were able to speak with them? They wanted to know who I was on paper. So they wanted it to be facts and then they have a department that reviews it. And it was the same with the bank. So even though you present it to the bank, they have a department that reviews it like, okay, this is the proper one that we need because I'm sure you can explain there are different types of power of attorneys. So the one you want is the all-inclusive one, but the bank or whatever institution you're dealing with is going to look at and see is that what they need for whatever service you're requesting. And when we use the term durable power of attorney, that's specifically what the bank is looking for. Does this power of attorney allow the person requesting the information give them access to the banking information that they seek. And when we when we draft the durable power of attorney, it gives you access to banking information, it gives you access to even sell property on behalf of someone else. So it's what we call the strongest, or you may even hear some attorneys call it the superpower of attorney. Now, when we sent it to the life insurance company, do you remember why you had contacted the life insurance policy? I think we were just wanting to know what the um, benefits were, you know, what were outlined, what kind of coverage she had and what it was for and what the, the amount was. I believe at that point in time, um, we were looking to see if we could use any of the money in the life insurance to take care of her when she came back home. Right. And it was just as almost a backup plan. I mean, because we were going to go forward with all the tools that I knew, but um, some policies have little things where you can pull out money if you need additional care, if it's available. So we were just doing it to, as pretty much inquiring about it. We didn't end up using it, that, that benefit, but we just wanted information. And without that power of attorney, you wouldn't even have access to get that. Even when you explain that the policyholder or your loved one is unable to have this conversation or to give you permission, too bad, so sad. That's pretty much in a way to protect them. But it's unfortunate if you get into an emergency situation and you're like, my loved one can't give me permission. She can't say it's okay for you to talk to me and you're stuck. And just a quick word of advice, when you have the power of attorney, when you have a durable power of attorney, it allows you to even um, perform your duties um, even when that person is, is incapacitated, when they can't make any decisions sure. for, them, for themselves. Mm -hmm. If not, then you have to go through another process called guardianship, which we don't have time on this podcast <laughs> to, to, to talk about. But I remember some of the information that, that the insurance company provided to you was exactly how much was the benefit and what you needed to do in order to obtain um, the finances. And so when unfortunately Aunt Enid did pass away, we already knew what we had to do. And we knew how much you were gonna get, we knew how much your sister, we, we knew how much all the beneficiaries were gonna sure. get. And you, you were able to utilize those uh, that those those assets in a, in a very pr productive way. Would Absolutely. you agree? 
Yes. If not for that documentation, <laughs> we would have been what up a tree without a paddle. That's what I'm saying. I thought it was a creek. A creek. There you go. You can't be up a tree without a paddle. Well, anyway. <laughs> not last I checked. Now, one of the things that I, w- I want to focus on is what are some of the gaps you see in families' life care plans that they have for their loved ones or their elderly loved ones? Definitely not having adequate support at home. So mom thinks, I have six kids. I know I'm going to be cared for if I get sick. But your six kids work, three live out of town, two live out of the country. So nobody thinks how that will happen if it happens they just assume it'll happen that someone's going to take care of me all these kids i have and i have brothers and i have my neighbor is my best friend who's also 86. so one of the biggest plan is just not having one just simply not you think about it but you never really shared shared it with anyone or maybe you told your daughter but you didn't implement anything so one of the biggest plans is just really not having one and really not having the support you think you have. While everyone may mean, oh, I would love it. if mom gets sick, I am there. But you have your own family, you have your own life. And it is just an unrealistic expectation that everything is going to fall into place on its own if something were to happen. It's just, it's not, it's not realistic. So that's one of the biggest ones. Um, and that falls right into the next one of just not having the conversation and saying, Because even us, we talked about it for years. Like every time we went to Jamaica, we're like, okay, we're going to do it this time. We're going to meet with this. We're going to get this done. And here we are. Because no one expected my mom to get sick and and pass in five months. Like Mm -hmm. it's still unbelievable. So while we had some things in place, we still were missing things. Mm. We still were missing things. From our own experience, we know how vital it is to one, have the conversation and then to implement the plan and knowing that you and I both work in this area is not even it wouldn't be difficult for us to put these things in place for for our family and to be honest for those of you listening you know it wouldn't be it's not going to be difficult for for you guys either this is not something complex it's basically what is it that you want to happen and then we, as a team, as a resource, can one, provide the documentation necessary to make sure your plan is implemented, or two, provide the resources so that the whole care, the, the entire scenario can, can be put together. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I wanted to, to, to mention is that oftentimes um, firms or practices deal with just the estate planning or, or Medicaid having the legal documentation. I'm just so excited that, you know, we have your experience and background because you add a, a different element. You you combine or marry the two. I guess that's why we got married. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> who, who would have thought that, you know, God would have brought us together for this, right? With your experience and my experience. Yeah. What last words do you want to leave with with individuals? What tips do you want to leave with them um, as they go out and take this information and utilize it for their benefit? To just have the conversation. It's hard. It's uncomfortable. Mom, what do you want to see happen if you got sick? Mom, where would you want to be buried? Some people do not know. Remember, I had to ask my dad that. I'm like, (laughs) by the way, you know, you don't even have a church. Where, Where would you want to be buried? So it's it's a hard conversation, but it's absolutely necessary because the time not to have it is when they're in ICU or when they are have Alzheimer's. Or And again, no one expects our parents to be sick. No one expects, and that's why it's unexpected. That's why it's an mm-hmm. emergency. No one wants to wait. It's, that's the absolute worst time. And oftentimes we tell individuals, have the hard conversation, Have deal with the hard issues now so that it can be a little easier later you know so when the person's in ICU or you know god forbid they pass away it's just a little easier knowing that you had a plan in place but unfortunately we operate in crisis mode right. all the time we take it easy now we don't want to have the hard conversation now and so it may be easy now but then it becomes hard later yeah and i know even when your grandmother both grandmothers pass it is the absolute best gift to leave your family is having a plan. 
not letting the, the siblings are going to fight anyway, unfortunately. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the best gift you can give your family, including your sisters and brothers, including your nieces and nephews, because it's everyone is affected mm -hmm. by the death, not just the nucleus of the family. But the best gift is to have a plan. This is where my burial is. This is who's in charge of everything. It is the best gift because there's no win when your loved one passes no matter how peaceful or comfortable even when everything is in place it's still going to be hard but it relieves such a burden on the family and the loss is still great but it it is so much more palatable when you don't have these additional decisions and hard things to think of Every family member is not going to be okay with that because there are going to be some, you know, loved ones who are like, I I'm not talking about it. Um, and there's that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the takeaway is talk about it. Say, Mom, this is hard, but we need to probably have this conversation. We don't want to wait. And in fact, I would invite them to have that conversation with us. Sure. Because a lot of times they may not know what questions sure. to ask. Absolutely. You know, countless times when I'm interviewing clients, we go through these particular questions. And a lot of times the first response is, you know what, I've never thought about That's that. Right. That's and right. And so, you know, we can have that conversation because we know what questions to ask. And not only do we not only do we know what questions to ask, we know what the answers are, or, or you know, we can give you advice to what you or guidance. Because not only do we do that as a job, but we've experienced it <laughs> on a on a first hand basis. We've experienced pretty much anything or everything that that they're they're going through. So, you know, you know, there's tons of resources available to them, and. One thing I've always heard is that with wisdom or with knowledge comes power. Uh, and, you know, what greater ability knowing that because of the knowledge and information and wisdom you have, you have the power to execute a great plan so that, you know, when these crisis situations do happen, you are prepared for and them. they will happen. They will happen. Again, in the words of my mother, if you fail to plan – plan to fail. Thank you, baby, for being on our podcast. Thank you for having me. It wasn't so bad, was it? Not bad at all. <laughs> Again, I want to thank you all for listening to our first episode of Law Matters and continue to sign in and follow us on YouTube and on Facebook for more wonderful programs as we've had here today. Bye. Bye. Love you. <laughs> Love you.